The International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia is now in session. L'audience, the Tribunal Penal International pour l'ex Yugoslavie, est ouverte. Please be seated. Get us ready. Yes, I'm going to start with Mr. Nice. Mr. Nice, is there anything which you need to address us on immediately before the uh, accused raises some point? I have several points to raise to deal with uh, matters that would typically, I think, be dealt with in a private session, even in a fully public session. They're procedural. Uh, they deal with disclosure to the accused, matters of that sort. Yeah, well, uh, and we'll uh, I'm happy to do them now or after the accused has made his point. We need, we need to deal anyway with a number of administrative matters, but uh, we'll start with the accused, uh, since we're in open session. Yes. Mr. May, at the end of last week, when there were no hearings, I received a decision from the registry in which I am prohibited of having any communication by telephone or any visits, and I don't understand why this came about. Are you informed of this? And I consider this to be in violent, uh, in gross violation of human rights, and I would request that the matter be addressed. It's not a matter we'll deal with at the moment. Um, we will look to see what the point is, and if necessary, we'll come back to it in due course. For the moment, we'll deal with those matters which are concerned with this particular issue. Yes. Um, you want to go to private session, Mr. Please. Okay. Two or three matters, potentially, which we have to address at this stage. The first is the extent, if any, it is appropriate with this important witness to have any evidence given under Rule 89F. He dealing with uh, the, uh, the um, accused very substantially on conversations, uh, some of which have been in dispute, in some cases heavily in dispute and it would therefore seem to us to be appropriate that those matters should be dealt with in open session. Uh, we are concerned uh, at the evidence which it is proposed uh, to be given uh, about the conflict. I'm referring to the end of the statement uh, and the uh, amount of uh, resultant cross-examination, which there must be in fairness if the evidence is given. Uh, and uh, finally, we have to deal with the admissibility of the book as a whole. General Clark, uh, I'm sorry you've been brought in. There's a misunderstanding. 
but it doesn't matter because you're, we're, we're going to have a debate about the uh, extent of your evidence uh, and how much we're going to, uh, to admit. And unless anybody objects, it seems to me, if you don't mind sitting, uh, listening, it may be no harm is done. I have no objection, Your Honor. Well, as to the second of the points that the court expressed as being a matter of concern, could the court possibly identify the particular passages which you say are, uh, are concerning because of the degree to which they would open up cross-examination? Uh, there's 44, 40... Let us deal with it in order. First yes. of all, the question of live evidence. Yes. I can tell you we have in mind that the, the witness's evidence should be given in live. Very well. It's, it's, it's a matter entirely for the court. Uh, as you know, when we first instituted 89F statements, we said we would apply uh, comprehensively in order not to take any advantage by selecting that which would be given live. We're entirely in the court's hands. Uh, for our, our part, there are both uh, exchanges where the previous witness, Klaus Naumann, was present, which might have fallen for different consideration. And there are passages where the accused is not present, but other, pa uh, other named persons are. It had occurred to us that those might have been stronger candidates for 89F, but we don't say any more than that. Very well. Next, uh, the book. Uh, we, we've had a chance of reading yes. those passages on yes. which you rely. And they uh, amount to um, some 10%, if that, of the, the total pages in the book, 40-odd pages against 400-odd. Yes. Uh, and having read the statement, it seems to us broadly that they cover uh, the same material in the most important part. Uh, and the others, I should have thought, were, were not of such significance that they should be admitted. But in any event, there is the question of principle, which is how right it is for a small part of a book to allow the admission of the whole, which of course deals with much broader matters. Uh, and uh, uh, we are therefore minded not to admit the book. Your Honor, we are of course in the court's hands and it may be something that falls for better, better consideration at the end rather than the beginning of the evidence and cross-examination. We provided you with only a limited number of pages in order, we hope, to help and to save the chamber from the burden of having to go through the totality of the book. We've considered the admission of the book uh, against the rulings that have been made under Rule 70, because, of course, those follow on an application for limitation of evidence made by us as part of the necessary Rule 70 agreements and requirements. Um, and there is an argument that uh, examination or certainly cross-examination outside the identified pages would be in contravention of the ruling of the chamber. We considered that yesterday with both the witness, his lawyers, but more importantly perhaps the United States government lawyers. And I think that the view taken was that a practical approach might be to say that could the whole book be uh, admitted and the witness would be happy to answer <coughs> questions on anything within its ambit. But if the court is at first sight um, and at this stage uh, inclined towards the view that less rather than more is appropriate, uh, we I think are happy to go along with that and await the position at the end of the cross-examination. Well, that's the course that we will follow. And then finally, Your Honour said that there were particular passages of the statement that might have led to a broader cross-examination or more extensive cross-examination than could be allowed for in the time available for this witness. I, I'm not sure exactly which paragraphs the court had well, in mind because we could consider them and see to what extent we really wish them to go in. But you may wish to consider uh, paragraphs 39 onwards which deal entirely with the conflict. Now, it's a matter for you what course you want to take, but the, the issue is, uh, if such evidence is given, uh, what uh, cross-examination it opens up in fairness uh, to the trial as a whole. Rather, may, uh, on the assumption that we go beyond, 
beyond the first break. May I come back to that immediately after the first break? Yes. And I suppose the final issue is, is timing. How long do you anticipate you might be? I wouldn't have thought that my examination of the witness will last very much more than one session, one ordinary one and a half hour session. Uh, the statement is compact, uh, and the witness knows his material. Uh, and the state and the uh, the, the witness has uh, made himself available, as we have uh, in our order stated, for two days. Is that right? Oh, yes, I think so. I haven't actually technically asked him that when his return sure. flight is. My oversight, but. Uh, well, no doubt that can be done. Uh, Mr. K, can you assist us with your view, or Mr. Puskovic, intend to ask any questions? Um, Your Honour, the, the matters so far in relation to the, to the book, I, in my view, it would be probably the position that we can take stock at the end of the evidence to see where we are. We've often made decisions at the start and ended up changing them by the finish of testimony. Um, in terms of time for cross-examination, um, the Amici would request half an hour. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Rosvich. Any near yes. I don't quite understand the position of this witness, since my understanding was that he would be testifying in closed session and that you described that as a temporarily closed session. And then in the meantime, representatives of the government of his country may be able to review the transcript to approve some of it, to redact some of it possibly, and only then to release it uh, to the public. I am not aware of any legal court in the world delegating its authority of this kind to any government. This would be the first time for any such thing to happen. Of course, you consider yourself to be a legal court. We are not going to argue this point. We have made our order. Uh, the reason that the uh, government have any rights in the matter at all is this, that in order to provide information to this court, it is occasionally, and I stress occasionally, necessary for governments to do so, and they are allowed to do so under our rules on certain terms, and these are one of the terms which have been followed in this case. Yes, Mr. Nice. Uh, perhaps we should begin, and we will uh, uh, ask the General Clerk to take the declaration, if you would. May I rem uh, diffidently remind Your Honour you, that you were going to make some rulings. I didn't know if you intended to make them before the witness started his evidence. No, very well. My misunderstanding. I think all the necessary rulings have been made. Your Honours, I solemnly declare that I will speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. If you'd like to take a seat. It's uh, Wesley Clark, correct? Yes, it is. And General Clark, for you are indeed General. Your history is set out in summary of your life, which is tab two of a bundle of exhibits. May that bundle be given a comprehensive exhibit number? Yeah, but yeah, there's, there's an issue as to whether the Tab one should be admitted because we've not admitted it under Rule 89F. Um, but 
we, we'll, what we'll do is we'll give the bundle a, no, a general number and we can review the position at the end as to which tabs are admitted. 617, Your Honours. May the witness at some stage have a bundle of exhibits, if that's convenient. General Clark, without going through your uh, personal history in detail, for it's a matter of public record, does it include that you graduated from West Point in 1966? From 1994 to 1996, you served as Director for Strategic Plans and Policy for the Joint Chiefs of Staff with responsibilities for worldwide United States military strategic planning. But from 1996 to 1997, you served as Commander-in-Chief of the United States Southern Command, Panama, where you were responsible for the direction of the United States military activities in Latin America and the Caribbean. And from 1997 through to May of 2000, you were NATO Supreme Allied Commander and Commander-in-Chief of the United States European Command. And in this position, you commanded the Operation Allied Force, which was NATO's first major combat action um, in the area of the former Yugoslavia. This is correct. General Clark, your first encounter with the accused, I think, was on the 17th of August of 1995, where you met him as one of a delegation that included Richard Holbrook and the late Joseph Cruzel uh, and others, including Colonel Drew and Robert Frazier. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and was this part of shuttle negotiations for a Bosnian peace deal? Yes, it was. Can you give us a little of, of the setting? What was the topics? Who was running it? Uh, and so on. Richard Holbrook was the leader of the American delegation, and this was our first meeting with um, Serb President uh, Slobodan Milosevic. We wanted to meet each of the leaders in the Balkans and present to them the general outline of what we believe to be a possible settlement that could be achieved, including a settlement achieved with the presence of some American troops as part of a NATO mission. And uh, this was the first meeting with uh, President Milosevic. We went to, uh, went to his office uh, there in the capital of Belgrade. Was one of the topics who should be representing the Bosnian Serbs in negotiating a peace plan? And if so, what was the accused reaction to that? Yes, this was the question because um, it had come up previously that some people were talking to uh, Karadic, and uh, we wanted to raise this issue, issue with uh, uh, Slobodan Milosevic. And so we asked him, should we be dealing with you or should we be dealing with the uh, Bosnian Serbs? And uh, then President Milosevic said, with me, of course. And as we continued the dialogue, uh, we said, well, why? And the basic reason was that he could deliver the peace agreement. And this, uh, this seemed improbable on the face of it. He was the president of a different country. And, um, and he, said, uh, he said, no, give me the terms of the agreement. We'll have an election, a referendum on this agreement. And, um, and we said, well, why would a referendum in a different country bind the Bosnian Serbs? He said, they will not go against the will of the Serb people. There came a time when you spoke to him with only one or perhaps a couple of people present, I think. Can That's you right. give the setting for that and then tell the court your recollection of precisely what was said? Well, after we'd had this exchange, um, a, a break was taken and Ambassador Holbrook went up to, to, um, to, to visit the facilities outside. The, the meeting generally broke up. President Milosevic stayed there. And um, Assistant Secretary Kruzel and I approached President Milosevic as he was standing there in casual setting outside the formal meeting. And 
I was still wrestling with the idea as to how it is that Milosevic could maintain that he had the authority and the power to deliver the Serb compliance with agreement. And so I simply asked him, I said, Mr. President, you say you have uh, so much influence over the Bosnian Serbs, but how is it then, if you have such influence, that you allowed uh, General Milotic to kill all those people in Srebrenica? And Milosevic looked at me, and um, for a, he paused for a moment. He then said, well, General Clark, he said, I warned Milotic not to do this. But he didn't listen to me. Your understanding of what he was referring to, if you have an understanding beyond the words themselves, can you give it to us? Because Certainly. We'll explain, if, if, if it does have a context and an understanding, how, how you arrive at that understanding. Well, it was very clear what I was asking was about the massacre at Srebrenica. When I said, kill all these people, it wasn't a military operation, it was the massacre. And this is what, in fact, had been in the news. It had been the starting point for the international agreements, which led to NATO's increased resolve to see an end to the fighting in the Balkans. And uh, so it was very clear what I was asking. It was also, to me, very clear what Milosevic was answering. He was answering that he did know this in advance, and he was walking the fine line between saying he was powerful enough, influential enough to have known it, but trying to excuse from himself the, um, uh, the responsibility for having done it. The next meeting, <coughs> I think, was on the 13th of September, or a subsequent meeting was on the 13th of September at the accused's lodge near Belgrade. Paragraph five of the statement serving as a summary, Your Honors. Did you have a discussion with Milosevic on this occasion with expectations that he might be able to make some contact with Mladic and Karadzic? Well, we had never, we had never expected when we went to this meeting that there would be a meeting with Milotic and Karadzic. This was a surprise. This was during the period of the bombing. May I just uh, ask, I have a technical problem with this computer. Maybe this button was hit or something and I don't know which button to turn it back on with. Thank you. Um, we went there as part of the shuttle diplomacy, and um, the bombing was going on. President Milosevic had been saying this bombing was bad for peace. And we, of course, were, the bombing was part of the pressure to convince the Serbs to fall back and release the grip of, of terror on Sarajevo. And Milosevic asked the delegation, he said, would you be willing to meet with Karadzic and Milotic? And Ambassador Holbrook called us aside. He said, what do you think? These men are now indicted war criminals. Should we meet with them in the interest of trying to um, stop and change the situation on the ground? And uh, the, the delegation agreed with uh, Holbrook that we should do this. Holbrook conveyed that information to uh, Mr. Milosevic, and Mr. Milosevic said, well, they're here. Um, you'll see them in just a couple of minutes. They're only a couple of hundred meters away. Indeed. We were surprised. We didn't know where they were. Next topic. Did you form a view as to the VJ and Serb leadership receiving operational reports from the VRS? If so, what was the view and, and why? Well, it was our view that the Serb military, that the VRS, was closely connected to the military of, the, uh, of Yugoslavia, the VJ. We knew this from electronic um, evidence, from reliable sources, and um, we even at one point went and told um, the Serb military that they had to turn off the air defense connectivity that linked the air defense system in, uh, in Bosnia with that in, um, in Serbia. So there was a, a clear connection. 
we knew that the Serb military had been had been carved out of the Yugoslav military. And when you asked Serb military to turn off the transmission, which particular Serb military leader did you address? Uh, it was uh, General Perisic. At the Dayton negotiations, did you meet somebody called Jovica Stanisic? Yes, I did. What was he introduced to you as? He was uh, introduced to me as the head of the Serb intelligence service. He'd been, uh, he'd been rumored uh, to be very, very influential. And uh, some people were surprised that he was at the negotiations, but there he was, and, and we all met him. The military annex uh, drawn at the Dayton negotiations, did you deal with Kreisnik and ask him to review a proposed military annex? If so, what happened and how was the problem resolved? We did uh, meet with the Bosnian Serb uh, delegation. I did hand the middle military annex draft to uh, Mr. Krajicnik and uh, ask him to consider this. Uh, I, I told him I'd like to have an answer back in the next day or two. This was early on in the negotiations. And uh, subsequently, he did give me the paper back, and most of the annex was simply lined through. It had the effect of completely, completely um, uh, obviating uh, the military annex. It would have put a military force into uh, Bosnia that had uh, no authorities. How did you attempt to resolve it? How was it resolved as a problem? President Milosevic had previously said that if there were any difficulties, to please consult with him. I arranged to see President Milosevic, said that uh, the Bosnian Serbs had rejected this military annex and asked for his help. He said, just give it to Milutinovic and he'll take care of it. And uh, that's exactly what happened. A day or so later, I got it back from uh, then Foreign Minister Milutinovic. Uh, he said, this is it. Uh, uh, there were a couple of minor changes at the beginning of the document, but all those portions which had been excised by the Bosnian Serbs were restored. I thanked Milutinovic. What did this reveal to you about where the decision-making power lay? Well, it revealed to me that, that President Milosevic uh, was uh, fully in charge of the delegation. During Dayton, was time spent going over military maps of various kinds, both physical and also computer? Yes, we did uh, spend a great deal of time on maps. Was one of those maps a map that you brought from uh, America, or had brought from America, that's on the easel beside you? Yes, this is a military map that was used to discuss the boundaries around Sarajevo and whether Sarajevo would, would remain a divided city or not. A copy of that map, Ronald, is given the marking tab 5 of Exhibit 617. General Clark, can you probably from where you are, but with the pointer that's available, explain to the court what the accused part was in dealing with this map. This is the map that was used in the middle of the night discussion between President Milosevic and Bosnian Muslim Prime Minister Harris Salajdic. And the discussion was, this is the city of Sarajevo, um, this is uh, some of the high ground around Sarajevo. This was the discussion about um, which parts of the terrain would be given back to the Muslims. And as I recall the discussion in red here, Milosevic had this red marker and he scratched things out on it. And, and this was a personal, these were personal scrawlings of the leaders here. It, it's a long time ago, but reminding yourself from the map, Looking at the, for example, the vertical line closer to Sarajevo that's been crossed out, right. and the line to the east. Yeah, I think, I, as I recall, this is the line that President Milosevic drew in right here and crossed this one out. And such a line would have 
achieved what for the Serb forces? It would have given a, it would have been a give back to the Muslims around Sarajevo. It would have been an effort to resolve this quarrel about how much ground would be given back around Sarajevo. It would have been a concession. To what degree did the accused in dealing with this map have personal knowledge? To what degree did he appear to need to speak to or seek assistance from others with more detailed knowledge? Uh, he appeared to have a great deal of personal knowledge and seemed to have no need to speak with anyone else. Even when drawing these lines? Correct. Next, the computer map. Did you work on a computer map with the accused? Yes, we did. It was actually at a time prior to this, as I recall, the course of the negotiations. It had to do with the corridor connecting the Bosnian Muslim-held enclave of Garazda with the bulk of the uh, territory that was to be held by the Bosnian Muslims and uh, by the Federation. And um, President Milosevic came in, we looked at the terrain from various angles, and we discussed the high ground and how much terrain would have to be um, surrendered to the Federation to be able to protect a road, a sovereign road, out to uh, Garazda. His level of knowledge when dealing with this issue and this computerized map? He seemed very familiar with the, the road, the terrain, and the uh, ability to draw the, the lines in the right place. I remember discussions about the specific area just south of Sarajevo and that road, and uh, he was not unfamiliar with this piece of ground. At the end of Dayton, did the American in delegation intend the Bosnian Serb leaders to initial the agreement? And if so, what was the accused attitude as to who should be signing? Well, it was the intent that, that everyone would um, uh, signal their intent, their agreement with the, uh, with the uh, final document. Uh, but the Bosnian Serb delegation did not sign, and uh, President Milosevic indicated that, that his uh, initials were adequate, that he would produce the Bosnian Serb's signature later. Going back to the computerized map, help us with this. In dealing with that map, did he turn to the Bosnian Serbs for any assistance? Or no, he did not. Moving beyond Dayton to 1997, was there an incident involving S-4 troops who had been placed at a television antenna to guard it, indeed? Yes, there was. There was a period of, um, of, of struggle around um, the city of Birchko in which uh, NATO troops ended up on top of a piece of high ground. It so happened there was a an television antenna there. We continued to occupy that antenna. One morning a mob showed up. President Milosevic had previously told me that any time there was trouble, just call him and he could handle it. I called him. I said, you're going to have to get the mob out of there. Um, they're threatening our troops, and if you don't pull them back, um, we'll take other actions. He said, well, no, this is just political. I said, no, it's not political. Um, this is a threat against the troops. Uh, it seemed that within a half hour or so, the mob disappeared. You addressed him. Was it regular for you to address him or to think of addressing him? Was there anybody else to address apart from him for a problem like this? It was, it was clear that he still had extraordinary influence, uh, if not control. It was never clear how much, but uh, he had always said that if there was a difficulty, call him, and I did. Paragraph 15 of the statement serving as a summary. And now turning to Kosovo. On the 15th of October of 1998, did you, together with Javier Solana, General Nyman fly to Belgrade to meet the accused for the purpose of getting signatures for an agreement about NATO overflight and verification. Yes, I did. Were you also going to deal with the proposed pullback of VJ and MUP forces from Kosovo? Yes, we were. You met the accused in Beli Dvor. By whom was he accompanied? Uh, as a, to the best of my recollection, he was uh, accompanied by uh, Milutinovic and Perisic. How long did the meeting last? 
um, perhaps three hours. And was the upshot of that and that in due course uh, the, the agreement was signed and we have that at the tab? Oh. Yes, the air verification agreement was signed. You can find that at tab five in the uh, bundle. Sorry, tab six, beg your pardon. Now, when dealing with this, did the accused ask Javier Solana when the NATO Act Tord would be cancelled? Yes, the accused was quite anxious to have the NATO Act Tord cancelled. And he did ask that question. Oh, well. Did that lead to a discussion or indeed an argument between him and Solana? Yes, it did, because um, Secretary General Solana made it clear that the Act Tord couldn't be cancelled until there was compliance with the UN directives that directed the pullback of the excessive forces that had been deployed in uh, in, in Kosovo since February of 1998. How consistent or otherwise was the accused's approach to Secretary General Solana? Well, it wasn't consistent. I mean, at first he had uh, denied that he'd, any, he'd made such an agreement, uh, then he denied that there were any excessive forces there or any new forces that had been deployed since that period. And then confronted with the evidence, he then relented and agreed to pull those military forces back that we had mentioned. You spoke to him directly on the basis of information that you had, and, and at that time he was accompanied by uh, General Perisic, I think. That's right. When he denied that there were any additional forces in there, um, I simply said, well, Mr. President, have you heard of the 211th Armored Brigade? Um, we were speaking English. He said, no, I've not heard of such a unit. Uh, he then turned and spoke to General Perisic in, in uh, Serbo-Croatian, and Perisic answered him, and then Milosevic came, uh, turned back, uh, looking unhappy, and said, all right, there is such a unit. And it went this way for several different units until, and each one he subsequently agreed to pull out. It was a grudging acceptance. It wasn't um, an acceptance of pulling out of the excessive units. It was an acceptance of whatever you name will pull back. Did General Perisic take a part in uh, revealing the accuracy of your information for just the one example, the 211th, or was he taking a similar role in relation to other information you provided? He, he uh, confirmed the accuracy of the other two units that we'd provided. And was one of those matters you raised a, a police unit? It was, but in this case, this wasn't an army unit, and so General Perisic did not confirm it. And, uh, and President Milosevic tried to say this wasn't a unit, it was a precinct, or words to that effect. And did Perisic correct him on that? Uh, Perisic wasn't able to correct on that. And uh, we were left then with the issue of how many police were there and what was the um, what was the increased strength of the police. And at that point, uh, President Milosevic promised that he would send us that information and give us a full accounting of the police elements that were in there. My oversight in relation to an earlier matter on paragraph 14, very briefly, let's cover that. In the summer of 1997, did you have a conversation with Biljana Plavsic where she told you something that had been said to her by the accused about Stanisic? Just tell us about that, please. I did have a conversation with Biljana Plavsic, and she said that uh, Milosevic had offered to provide security for her um, through Stanisic and she rejected that offer of security. And let's pick up the story at paragraph 18 of the statement serving as summary. 
uh, your next meeting on the 20th of October when you returned to Belgrade to discuss I was raising pa paragraphs um, 27 to 28. You may want to look at those again. But, time, but uh, you can look at them over the adjournment. Look at them in the sense that yep. querying whether. Yeah. Stake was mine. I was I was getting ahead. <coughs> so on the twentieth of October, you returned to Belgrade to discuss MUP data that had been de delivered by uh, the Fry, and I think it was your intention to press further for the withdrawal of forces. Is that correct, General? That's correct. This was a time in which uh, we had to work an agreement to pull back the forces in compliance with the UN Security Council resolution. And, um, and I spoke with President Milosevic. I uh, asked that his generals cooperate in doing this. We had a full disclosure by the military and the police of what they believed to be the KLA dispositions and where their own forces were at least where the military forces were. The police dispositions still weren't quite complete. And we deal with that in just a second, but before we do the composition of the meeting and the function of the people attending, was the accused accompanied by Militinovich, but also by a more personal advisor? Yes, uh, he was accompanied by uh, Militinovich and, as I recall, by uh, Goran Milinovich. Tiny detail, the man Milinovich, what did he do in this or in any other meetings that you saw him at? What, what service or function did he appear to provide? Um, Milinovic had, uh, was present at almost every meeting we ever had with Milosevic. He seemed to be the chief of staff. He was the note taker. He was the man who listened, who monitored, who I guess uh, ensured that the directions uh, given by Milosevic were implemented. But he did make notes. Seemed to make notes. I recall him having a notebook and, uh, and a pen there. Before we come to what it's going to be Georgievich and Perisic were able to tell you, was there at one stage a private meeting between you and the accused where you walked to an adjoining room and spoke to him about what he should do? Yes, there was. Tell us about that, please. When I began the meeting with President Milosevic on the 20th of October, um, there didn't seem to be a spirit of cooperation. And uh, in front of his uh, advisors, he seemed to be uh, wanting to, again, uh, backtrack and, and refuse to pull forces out and so forth. I asked him to uh, step aside. I saw, spoke to him one-on-one, -on -one, and I warned him that um, if he didn't comply with the request of the United Nations that uh, action would be taken against him in the form of bombing. His response? Well, his response was uh, at first to shrug this off, and then on reflection, he decided uh, he, that he would cooperate. He said he'd ask his general, tell his generals to cooperate. By his response, did he indicate the ability to control his generals or not? He certainly indicated the ability to control his generals. Absolutely. No question about it. Turning now then to Georgievich and Perisic, and in that order, when you spoke to, to Georgievich, was there a map available? Yes, we laid out a map um, in a room off the president's office there. and. Uh, General Georgievich went through the map in some detail, pointing out the location of each of the KLA remnants that were there. 
Also present at this meeting, do you remember who else was present? General Perisic was there also, and uh, then he began to talk about the military dispositions that were present. Before we come to, to, to that, can you remember who else was present? doesn't matter if you can't at the moment. Um, I had with me some staff members. I had uh, my political advisor, Mike Durkee, uh, staff assistant, Colonel Dennis Domingo, the intelligence officer, Brigadier General Glenn Schaefer, and um, as I recall, somewhere in this meeting also a Major General Lukic came in, another MOOP officer. In the course of your discussion with Georgievich and in, in the marking of the map, was it possible to count the number of alleged KLA people concerning Georgievich? Yes, we, we added up these numbers and they totaled 410 KLA according to Georgievich's analysis. D did you raise that with him? And if so, tell us what he said. Well, I certainly did. I, I said that, uh, that you, you forced, words to the effect that you forced 350,000, 400,000 people out of their homes. You're trying to destroy the province to get at 400 people. And he said, uh, we were within two weeks of killing them all. He said, why did you stop us? And I said, because you're targeting a civilian population and it's, it's creating a humanitarian catastrophe for your own people. Fair enough. Did you say anything further about the appropriateness or otherwise of using force? Well, I made it clear that that wasn't appropriate. It was illegal against the law. It just, it's not done. Now let's turn to Perisic, who of course you'd recently seen uh, being slightly counter to the accused in his fulsome answers or more fulsome answers about troop dispositions, hadn't you? Mm -hmm. What happened with him on this occasion? Well, he pointed out the military locations and he discussed the size of the units that were out there and so I had a very good feel for the military dispositions and also how they were deployed tactically after I finished the discussion with General Perisic. And uh, by way of an example, how full was his information when he identified a tank? Well, it seemed to be very, he was very forthcoming, I would say. Well, we saw a couple of tanks here, and he would say, yes, that's a company. Or I said, so if we saw a dozen vehicles here, he'd say, yes, that's a battalion. So it indicated that we were only seeing a small portion of the total size of the force that was actually there. Was his approach for the army similar to or different from the approach of Georgievich for the MUP? He seemed to be very he seemed to be very forthcoming in terms of the discussion of the issues. Did this meeting result in any pullback, if so, complete or partial? This meeting resulted in a a plan for a partial pullback of some forces around Militiava a sort of a phase one of a pullback. And did this lead to another meeting four days later on the 24th, this occasion uh, General Naaman being present? I took this partial pullback plan. I warned them at the time that I didn't have any authority to negotiate anything for NATO. I took it back to NATO. I said, NATO is going to take a look at, it, at all the information you've given, and then we'll see what happens. And so it turned out that General Naaman and I were sent back on the 24th of uh, October. Who was present at this meeting? Um, at this meeting, we first began with President Milosevic, and there was Militinovich there, Shinovich, Perisic, and, uh, and others. The meeting started when and lasted how long? It went, uh, the initial meeting went around uh, 5 o'clock and um, for maybe an hour. What hour. was yeah. your and Klaus Naumann's objective? Well, the idea was to get a real pullback of all the forces and comply with the UN Security Council um, resolution. We had a NATO act order in place. There was a time deadline we were working against here. And uh, we um, wanted to say in very direct terms to President Milosevic was that this was the time that he must pull these forces back. 
At one stage, did Perisic organize a quiet meeting with you or a private meeting with you? Yes, what happened was that Milosevic said, well, you'll, you'll have to go back and continue to work this with these generals. So we went to Perisic first, and, uh, and Perisic said, um, we're the only, uh, he, he went through the disposition, we talked about how many forces could be pulled back reasonably, and, uh, but he said that only President Milosevic could give the authority to pull these forces back. And he warned us, and he asked, he asked me, he said, please do not destroy the Yugoslav military. He said, this is the last democratic institution in Yugoslavia. When he said that, had he made arrangements about the number of people present to hear oh, him speak? <laughs> yes, he had. He, he made sure everybody else was out of the room except for the interpreter. And as a result of this, did you have hopes that you might accelerate the negotiations? That seemed to be a very a promising attitude, but on the other hand, we recognized that Milosevic had total control of what was going to be decided. Did you then make a decision as to whether you were going to achieve a full pullback or whether you needed to take things further with the accused? At that point, it was clear that we'd gotten as far as we were going to get with Perisic, and uh, so we decided to go back and see Milosevic and his team. On this occasion, was this again back at Belly Dvor, on this occasion were others present, some you meeting for the first time? Well, Shinovich was there. That, as I recall, that's the first time I'd met Shinovich. Um, the police uh, people came in, and... Um, um, we assembled the whole group again. This must have been around 8 or 9 o'clock at night uh, on that Saturday night, the 24th of October. What was the accused's initial reaction at this part of the adjourned, or how you describe it, meeting? Well, we, we said to the accused, um, essentially, he said, we didn't get any satisfaction here. This is not enough. And I said, General Nauman has an idea. And General Nauman and I talked about this previously. I turned to him. He said, you're going to have to pull these excess police back. Just pull them all back, Mr. President. That, that's the only way to solve this problem. That's the only way to get rid of the act or all the excess police out. And uh, Milosevic looked startled. And uh, then he excused himself. He went back into another room with his team. They were in there for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then they came back into the meeting room with us. And uh, Milosevic agreed in principle, and then he said, you'll have to continue the discussions now and work out the details of this. With whom were you instructed to work out the details? We went back at that point to the Serb Ministry of Defense, uh, and as I recall, it was um, Foreign Minister Milutinovic, um, General Perisic, Georgievich, Lukic, and uh, I think Shinovich was still there. He went in and out, as I recall. Did those negotiations continue until the early hours of the following morning, the 25th of October, when you returned to see the accused at Belly Dvor? That's right. These, these negotiations, negotiations ended, I think, around between 4.30 and 5 o'clock on the morning of the 25th of January. And you saw the accused at what time, roughly? As I recall, it was around 9 o'clock. We had the results at that point. We cleaned up. I checked back in with headquarters, and uh, so we went back around 9 o'clock. And you were now in a position to require reduction of rather more than you'd originally identified as the number. Well, the problem was, yes, that's correct, because uh, General Nauman had given the number of excess police at 3,000. The correct number was 4,000, so we had to go in and see uh, Milosevic. He said he wanted to make some changes in the agreement. We said, uh, fine. We listened to him. We said, no, we want to make a change in the agreement. It's not 3,000 police. It's 4,000 police that have to be pulled out. Did he accept that, or did he resist that? With reluctance, he accepted that. Did he attempt an argument about accepting more MUP presence? Yes. How did he base that? Well, it's, I'm sorry. He, es he essentially said he wanted to stand on the original 3,000 figures. He said, where did you get the information? Of 4,000, I said, it came from your own documents. He had given us the documents as a result of the 15 October meeting. 
the argument to have more milk present was that from Milosevic or from someone else? We were only talking, as I recall the meeting, we were only talking to Milosevic at this point. There had been discussion the previous night with Milutinovic about the numbers of MOOP and whether they could be there and be out of uniform and so forth. But on Sunday morning, um, Milosevic presented his changes that he wanted. Uh, we considered them. We agreed to some of them. We explained the rationale for the document. And then we presented this change. And we said, you're going to have to take 4,000 out, not 3,000 out. During this part of the negotiations, did there come a time when the accused referred to not, not historical events going back to 1946? And if so, uh, from recollection, could you tell the court what it was he said and what effect it had on you? We had achieved agreement, and then it remained to type up the agreement and, and get it signed. And, and so uh, this must have been 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning or something, and uh, President Milosevic was musing philosophically about this. And he turned to me and he said, General Clark, he said, we know how to handle these murderers, these rapists, these criminals. He said, we have done this before. I said, well, when? He said, in Drenitsa, in 1946. And I said, what did you do? He said, we killed them. He said, we killed them all. I was stunned at the vehemence with which he spoke. And I just looked at him. General Nauman looked at him, as I recall. And Milosevic then said, then he qualified his statement, he said, we did not, of course, we did not do it all at once. It took some time. Did he say how long it took? He did, I don't recall him saying that. Oh. The agreement being retyped as you, or typed as you've explained, when it was brought in for signature, what did you notice about those who were to sign? that Milosevic, I noticed that Milosevic's name wasn't on the agreement. Did you raise that with him? What was I, I did raise it with him. He said it wasn't necessary. I said, well, it is necessary, and ask him to sign it. Did you indeed have to press him to sign it and explain the level of people that you uh, typically dealt with in your negotiations? I did have to press hard on this because it's been my experience with, with in dealing with leaders in this part of the world and and with President Milosevic, they, they typically didn't like to sign documents because it meant then that they could no longer disavow them. And I was determined that President Milosevic would sign this. We had negotiated it with him. He had the authority. And had he not signed it, my concern was that he would have then been able to say, well, I, you know, I didn't really see this, and he would have been able to disavow it. So his signature on that document was very important because it represented his promises to NATO. Well, this document has already been exhibited as uh, Exhibit 94, Tab 3. Perhaps it can just be laid on the overhead projector for the witness to see the way the signature was placed. on the screen, I think, myself. I don't know if the judges do. Yes, there it is. Thank you. Uh, as we can see, no place on the typed version for the accused to sign. You and General Nauman required him to sign. Just show us where, please. Right. This is, this is the signature block. This was typed up in Yugoslavia, in Belgrade. There, while I talked to Milosevic, and these were the signatures that he wanted on there. I mean, this is what was typed on there. And of course, it had our names, General Nauman's name and my name on it. And then this is where he signed it at our insistence. Thank you very much.
and this document is the record of the meeting on the 25th of October of 1998, the matters agreed being set out in an attached statement. I turn to paragraph 30, the 20th of December of 1998. Did you go to Belgrade on this occasion to meet a, a, new, a person new to you, uh, Colonel General Oidanich? I did. We knew that Perisic was in trouble and based on the atmospherics of the meetings in October. I was not surprised that he was replaced by General Oydenich, and I wanted to be certain that General Oydenich understood the obligations that Yugoslavia had accepted through the Milosevic document. Who else was present on this meeting? Well, Mr. Shinovich was there. Apparently, I wasn't going to be allowed to meet with General Oydenich without Mr. Shinovich being present. At the time, what was your judgment uh, about this? What did it say about the level of confidence or trust reposed in Odanich? It said that Oydenich wasn't, um, he wasn't sufficiently trusted to meet alone, alone with me with the interpreters present that he needed the political guidance of, uh, of Mr. Shinovich. Did you raise, really to raise with Odanich, the presence of VJ tanks north of Pristina near Poduyevo? Yes, at that point we'd already seen the evidence of the violation of Milosevic's commitments to NATO. They'd already been deploying tanks north of Pristina along the main line of communication near Podjevo. And I raised this with General Oydenich. And um, he said, well, it was a training mission. Well, these weren't training missions. And under the agreement, they would have had to be notified in advance. And they weren't. In giving his answer to you, did he speak without assistance, or did he discuss the matter at all first with uh, Shinovich? Each answer that he gave me was uh, first coached with Shinovich, or cleared with Shinovich. You made an assessment of Idanich. I don't know whether you made it there and then at this meeting or later, but what was your assessment? Well, I thought he was a placeholder, someone ambitious enough to want the job, and maybe someone who wouldn't ask too many of the tough questions that had gotten General Perisic in trouble. Ratchak, uh, following that event, did you and General Lauman travel to Belgrade on the 19th of January to meet the accused and to attempt to arrange investigation of the Ratchak incident? Yes, we did. Did you have objectives about Ambassador William Walker as well? Yes, we wanted Ambassador Walker to remain in the country. And we, and we wanted Milosevic to reaffirm and maintain his, the commitments that he'd made to NATO in the 25 October document. The meeting was in Belly Dvor. How long did it last? This meeting in Belly Dvor lasted seven hours. Milosevic was accompanied by whom on his side? I recall um, Mr. Milutinovic and Mr. Shinovich. Was one of the topics you raised in this long meeting the uh, possibility of the then ICTY prosecutor, uh, Louise Arbour, being permitted access to investigate the Ra Ratchak massacre? Yes, this was the first topic that we raised. The accused re uh, reaction to it? Um, he, employed, he employed several different lines of reaction. First, he reminded us that he had never agreed to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Tribunal inside Yugoslavia. We then said, well, you promised to cooperate with the ICTI. Then he said there was no massacre. Um, and then he said, well, there were, there were bodies. And then he, we continued to persist. He said that Ms. Arbor could come as a tourist. First he said she couldn't come. Then she could come as a tourist but she'd have to be escorted. Then she'd have to be escorted by the Minister of Justice. She couldn't investigate anything. Then she could look at the bodies, but she could only look at them with other people present. As these proposals were made, did you relay them to Justice Arbour for her reaction? Yes, I did. I called her several times, in each case affirming her opinion of the various offers that Mr. Milosevic made. How, were your ex how did your exchanges with the accused on this topic end? 
essentially, it came to the point that he was not offering her a satisfactory opportunity to come and do the investigation. And he continued to dance around the issues and failed to comply with what was required. And so I posed it to him in very simple terms. I said, if you don't want her to come, just say so. If you don't want her to come, otherwise, let her come, give her the authority to do the investigations properly. He said, no, he didn't want her to come. Turning to Ambassador Walker, the accused attitude in relation to him, how was it resolved? Milosevic continued to say that Ambassador Walker had violated his responsibilities as a diplomat by labeling this as a massacre, and that it was the decision of the Serb government that he had to leave. Did you have a discussion or a short exchange at any event with Milutinovic about this during a break? Yes. Um, by this time, as I recall, Milutinovic was no longer the foreign minister of Serbia, but he was the president of Serbia, and Milosevic had moved up to be president of Yugoslavia. But, but Milutinovic said um, on the side, he says, now this is going to be, you, you could get a compromise on this. This is, listen to what, what, what President Milosevic is saying. He's saying it's the, in essence, it's the will of the government. So he's offering a compromise. It's, he might not, he might give in on this. In the event, was there any conclusion to this part? No, there the wasn't. Discussion? There was no, not a conclusion other than the fact that Milosevic seemed to be determined that Walker must leave. So far as the October agreements uh, were, commitments were concerned, what was the accused attitude? Compromising, uncompromising, what? Milosevic told me, he said, I, I, I'm not going to comply with these agreements. Um, I warned you that we would, quote, defend ourselves and, and so we're not complying with these agreements. Your reaction to that, what did you tell him? Well, I explained to him that this, his actions went well beyond any reasonable defense. They were disproportionate. They violated the agreements. And I said that if you persist in this, NATO is going to tell me to start moving aircraft. In other words, implying that he was not, com not living up to his terms of the agreement, and NATO would then invoke the act ord. Did you, in your exchanges with the accused, take a, a strong line make reference generally to what he was doing to his country? Yes, I try to put this in terms that he could understand what would, what the consequences would be um, for him and his international position. I said that NATO is going to be asking, these leaders are going to be asking, what is it that you're trying to do to this country? You force professors to sign loyalty oaths, um, you have uh, crushed democracy, you've taken a vibrant economy, you've wrecked it. Um, they're going to be asking what kind of a leader are you? What did that lead the accused to say and do? Well, President Milosevic became very angry, and uh, he then, uh, he claimed that there were no loyalty oaths, that Serbia was a democracy, and he accused uh, General Nauman and me of threatening him. He, uh, he said, you are the war criminals. You try and calm him down? Yes, I wanted to get back to a rational discussion. And um, so uh, he did calm down, but we never made any more progress. And at one point in this meeting, did you refer back to something that you understood uh, the accused had said to Ambassador Holbrook? Yes, Holbrook had told me that Milosevic had said at one point that Kosovo is more important than his neck. And I asked, Milosevic to confirm that, and he said, no, that's not correct. I said it was more important than my head, meaning that that was the center of Serbian civilization, and, uh, and that's, that was the uh, essence of what he was saying, that that was the key to his political future. On the earlier occasion there had been reference to what had happened in 1946, was there any uh, further reference to that? I believe there was. Oh, no, I'm three paragraphs short of the place you've asked me to 
start a reconsideration. Uh, we've been going just an hour. I don't know if that would be a convenient moment. Yes. We'll, we'll take the break now. Uh, General Walker, we have to warn. Uh, it's General Clark, sir. I'm sorry, <laughs> General Clark. Uh, we have to uh, warn all witnesses, as we do, uh, not to speak about their evidence until it's over. Could I uh, uh, do the same with you? Uh, we understand that you're giving a lecture tonight uh, on international relations. Of course, that's fine. But um, uh, formally, I must, of course, tell you not to discuss the case during it. Of course. Yes, we'll uh, adjourn now. 20 minutes. All rise. We will have in. All arise, we will have Please be seated. Yes, Mr. Paragraph 36 in the statement serving as summary. General Clark, when were you first aware of any Fry forces being involved in an offensive in Kosovo? Well, we started to see the indicators of this, and we began to hear the indicators in January. Um, we'd already seen the, the forces violating the agreement. We knew it was just a matter of time. As I said, in late December, we saw the forces moving out. We continued to see more forces deployed. What and about the Podievo area, and, and, and what, did you, what did you learn of and when there? Well, these were the w first ones moving out um, in December 98 that I had warned General Oydnich about on my visit down there on or about the 20th of December of 98. Yeah. And, and then we continued to see those forces deployed out there. They, mo they maneuvered around. And as far as we could determine, what they were doing was they would go around a village, they would stir up trouble, they would look for opportunities to use force, use their guns, heavy guns, and so forth. Again, uh, and, and from memory if you can, of course, any elements of any particular armor brigades that you can bring to mind as having featured at this time? We continued to watch the 211th Armored Brigade um, because it had been uh, pulled out. We'd seen it in there earlier. It came back in um, to the border and then and then began to deploy inside Kosovo again. And as to the Pristina Corps, did you notice anything or were you informed of anything as to its level of arms? Well, we saw it being reinforced. It was the command and control headquarters for the province and then we saw reinforcements added to it so that it became much more capable. Did you form a, uh, a a judgment as to the degree to which it had been enlarged. It may have been doubled in strength. It had a lot of additional forces with it. Did you get to learn of something called a joint command? And if the answer is yes, can you indicate your 
source of knowledge in the most general terms and what you understood that to be? Well, I had two general sources of knowledge. First, I'd received some kind of an indication <clears throat> when I'd first met Shinovich and uh, the accused had introduced him as being someone who was in charge of this. And then it was clear from other reliable sources that there had actually been a, a joint, some kind of a joint police and army headquarters established to be able to deal with the region, and that Shinovich had some kind of a role in that, perhaps a role that enabled him to undercut the authority of the general staff. What purpose could you see in the use of the Joint Command? Well, uh, first, it was necessary to, it would have been necessary to coordinate the military and police activities on the ground. But it served an adjunct purpose as well because it avoided the direct control of the armed forces by the general staff. And just following on from the comments that Perisic had made to me, I assumed that there were still elements within the general staff which might have not been under the full political control of President, then President Milosevic, then thus enabling him to bypass whatever might have, resistance there might have been. In early March of 1999, did Secretary General Solana give you some instructions as to what you were to do uh, so far as General Oydenich was concerned. Yes, we continue to see the buildup of these forces, and I would I brought them to Solana's attention. He said, okay, he said, you got to call and, and, and ask him, to tell Oydenich to stop bringing those troops in. See if you can give him a warning to stop doing it so it doesn't escalate the crisis further. And uh, I did call Oydenich, um, and I told him we were watching what he was doing. I asked him not to do this. He um, replied that, uh, that we were causing him to do this, that he was doing this in self-defense against the threat of a NATO invasion. And of course, there was, there was no possibility of a NATO invasion at that point. I, I told uh, Ordnitz that he shouldn't do it. He said that there were forces coming in to Macedonia. I explained that these forces weren't sufficient for an invasion and warned him that he was violating the October 1998 agreement that I had met with him on the previous December. With what military or other objective was the build-up of troops consistent in your then judgment, General? All of this was consistent with the plan that we'd heard rumored to seek the final solution to this problem in 1999 seek the final solution by, by what? That is to say, by using a, a large-scale ethnic uh, cleansing operation against the people in Kosovo. On a, in light of the Chamber's observations about paragraphs 39 to 45, with your leave, I will deal with the first sentence of paragraph 39 and with paragraph 41, subject to laying a foundation for knowledge and not the balance. I don't know if that will be acceptable to the Chamber. It, it is simply a question of the extent of cross-examination yes. which is to be let in by the Secretary, but that's the only point which we make. Uh, I quite understand that, and we're grateful for the concern that the Chamber's expressed through that question to me. First sentence of paragraph 39 is a simple pop point. Paragraph 41 is a matter of pattern evidence. I would be interested in pattern connecting between one conflict and another. And I would be seeking first the witness's account of his knowledge for that sort of material. Yes. General, on what day or Approximately what day, in your judgment, did the Serb offensive begin? Either Friday the 19th or Saturday the 20th, as NATO um, could best determine. In the course of your 
uh, statement you deal with, it happens at paragraph 41, but don't, don't refer to that, please. You deal with the pattern of events, a typical pattern of events, where the VJ uh, and other units came to be involved. Before I ask you for what that pattern was, can you explain what your sources of information were in the most general terms so that we can understand how you could form this judgment? got this from both the news media and other reliable sources, so it was a combination of uh, information. And what was the pattern of involvement of the VJ, the MUP, and or other uh, units? It seemed consistent with an earlier pattern that we had observed over the decade in conflict in former Yugoslavia, namely that the military surrounds an objective, it blocks it, it prevents reinforcement or exit. The uh, police then go through, they, uh, they, they arrest people by name, they have particular information that they search for. The paramilitaries then go in <coughs> and threaten people and rob them and so forth, and then people are thrown out of their homes afterwards, all under the control of the authorities. The pattern that you've identified, was it something in your judgment as a, a soldier that could have happened with or without the knowledge of the local VJ or the local MUP? Could not have happened without the coordination of the VJ and the MUP. And based on what I'd seen of the Army, um, it had to have happened with high level command and control because this was still a disciplined force. I want to return to one topic you dealt with earlier and ask you a couple of further questions about it. It's the air defense system. You'll remember telling the chamber, it's paragraph six, how you once told Perisic to turn off the transmission system. Can you amplify what you've already said about the air defense system, describing in a sentence what your judgment was of its nature, contrasting it with or comparing it with air defense system cooperation of, say, NATO countries or the, the United Kingdom, the United States, something like that? Well, this was an integrated air defense system. It was put together. Um, coherently laid out on a single template with various regional reporting nodes and, and a dispersed early warning radars and target acquisition radars and then a certain number of uh, missile launching sites and so forth. And, and um, it was uh, a leftover from Yugoslavia and it was still fully operational, so it indicated to me that this was as though there'd never been a separation between the VRS and the VJ. It was simply an integrated air defense system. How would that compare with, say, information sharing between uh, allies such as the United Kingdom and the United States, something like that, in, in the general terms, without saying anything that uh, would be revealing about particular relationships current at the moment? Well, under NATO agreements, countries uh, delegated their air defense to NATO, but it was still under a sovereign agreement. So there was uh, data sharing between nations, uh, but it was uh, data sharing over uh, national systems. So there was an international system on top. So what you've got right here um, is what was formerly a national system that had never been disestablished. It was still there in, you use the, in the case integrated. of Yugoslavia. Integrated, yeah. Is that means all the pieces would fit together, information would flow back and forth and so forth. As far as we could tell, it was seamless. And the significance of this, uh, what does it, and what does it reveal about the relationship between the uh, two armies concerned? Well, as we uh, looked at this, our uh, it, reliable information seemed to suggest that the separation of the two armies was, um, it was political but it wasn't substantive. In other words, that what had happened is that when these two armies separated as best we could, could figure this out, soldiers who had lived in, in the Republic 
of, uh, of, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, were taken out of the VJ, but the officers were shuffled in a general sense. <clears throat> Some officers volunteered to serve there, apparently others didn't. The training was still done, as far as we could determine, inside and by the VJ. Officer assignments were controlled by the VJ, and uh, promotions and pay were subject to the control of, of yes. the VJ. I'm more concerned about <coughs> being specific to the air defense system, its integrated nature. What does that reveal about the connection of the, of the two armies? Well, it, it meant that um, there was an integrated control of the system, so that decisions to fire or decisions to turn on radars and so forth were likely to have been made by Yugoslavia, not by the Serbs themselves in Bosnia. Uh, I just now deal with the present position so far as exhibits are concerned. If the summary of General Clark's background may become tab two, for the time being we pass over tab three, but I just ask the witness this as a, a, a fact. You wrote the book, Waging Modern War. Have you become aware since writing it of any corrections communicated either to you or to your publishers? No. No. There's a chart that shows uh, passages that the prosecution have asked the judges to have in mind from that book, and indeed at tab four, at uh, tab three, you have, I think, the excerpts from the book, Your Honours. The question is this: We are not going to admit that. Uh, do you want? Uh, so I can understand the position. I mean, are you saying that the, the book, uh, that, the, that the accused is free to uh, cross-examine on any part of the book? And uh, that is not as I had understood the position. Your Honour, that's not what we are seeking, well, um, especially in light of what Your Honour was uh, saying this morning. So that uh, even the extracts, it may be, don't need to be produced. It's no. No, most certainly not, because Very it well. seems to me there's an unfairness in, in producing extracts, which in any event are being given in evidence. Yes, certainly. Then on tab five, I said that there was uh, an interest in the exhibit from a museum. There is a letter which do doesn't need to become an exhibit, but can be distributed. Alternatively, it could become part of tab five, the map. It comes from the MacArthur Museum of Arkansas Military History, and it explains that the only change made to the map is the addition of a pencil accession number which it identifies. So it may be that th th this letter could become part of tab five, if the, particularly if the chamber is prepared to accept the copied version of the map as tab five in order to allow the original to return to the museum. Let's deal with that now. Yes, we will accept the versions which we have. The original can return to the museum. I'm grateful. M Mr. Knight, there are two maps in tab five, one of which isn't dealt with. Yes, it's I think the, the actual exhibit, if that's what you're referring to, is uh, a map and an overlay. Yes. And this, uh, what I see, I haven't got my own copy of them, but I think you'll find there's an original map without markings. Sorry, but um, not the same document. have, I think. The second appears to be an unmarked version of the first. That's right, because the, the exhibit itself, which is on the easel, is a map with a plastic transparent sheet on top of it on which markings have been made, so that what you see in your two maps is the original and the version as effectively marked by, uh, says the witness, the accused.
Your Honour, looking at the exhibits, tab six has now been produced as well. That's all I ask of this witness at this stage. General Clark, he'll be asked some further questions. Before you begin, Mr. Milosevic, there are some matters the trial chamber has to decide. Mr. Milosevic, before you begin cross-examining, you should know that there are parameters in this case beyond which you cannot go. Uh, we've already made an order which restricts the scope of cross-examination. I'm not going to go into the reasons for it again. It is limited to the statement which the witness has given which means that you are restricted in a way that you're not restricted with other witnesses because then you're allowed to ask any relevant matters. You're restricted in this case to the witness's evidence. So you could give, uh, ask him questions, of course, about what he said here, but not about other evidence. He's given no other evidence against you apart from the matter which General Clark has dealt with here. So your cross-examination in this case is limited. We have refused to admit the book. It's not part of the evidence. We therefore will not allow some free-ranging cross-examination through it, but you may, uh, if if you uh, are, are entitled to do so, and that will be a matter of relevance, uh, you can, uh, if you wish, ask General Clark about passages of the book which are related to his evidence. And that largely will be, if not entirely, will be the matters which already underlined. So subject uh, 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 to those matters, of course, uh, you may conduct your cross-examination, but you will be stopped if you go beyond those particular bounds. We've considered the time that uh, you should have. Um, 
we have in mind that you should have some two and a half hours, if you so wish, to cross-examine. And uh, it's now for you to begin. Mr. May, I don't understand at all how you can limit my cross-examination to two and a half hours. Well, I, we would look at the time that we've given you. It'll subject be uh, others' convenience, but also if you use the time properly and you wanted extra time, we would, of course, consider extending it. But it depends on your using it, and it seems to me two and a half hours should be adequate to deal with the limited matters which the witness has given in evidence. Very well, Mr. May. I see now that you're introducing some restrictions linked to the witness's book. And the witness's book is linked to the credibility of this witness, which means that I couldn't question the witness even in relation to matters that have to do with his credibility. Is that what it means, or am I, after all, allowed to ask certain questions along those lines? You know exactly what uh, you've been allowed to do. You must ask questions within those limitations. Very well, Mr. May. You will probably allow me to ask at least some questions. General Clark. In your book, you say that the NATO military action against Yugoslavia in the spring of 1999 uh, could not be called a war. I don't think we're going to have that debate. That's precisely what I've been talking about. Uh, you're not allowed a free-ranging discussion about the NATO action. You're limited to the evidence which the witness has given. Mr. May, a fundamental question here relates to the NATO strike against Yugoslavia. You're not allowing me to ask the witness about the war against Yugoslavia, of which he was in command. Then I don't know really what you're letting me ask him about. The witness hasn't given any evidence about that war. He has, uh, uh, the prosecution have chosen to call him on a limited number of issues, and he has given evidence about a limited number of issues. We will have to look elsewhere for evidence about those broader issues, which, if relevant, if relevant for us to consider, you want to put in front of us. But you can't do it through this witness. General Clark. General Clark, is it true that in an interview that you gave for the New Yorker on the 17th of November, you said that the war that you waged was technically illegal? That is precisely the point. He's given no evidence about the legality of the war. He's not gone into that in his evidence. Now, concentrate on what uh, evidence that he's given here, and you'll be allowed to ask the questions. But you can't go into these broader questions with this witness. If they're relevant, we'll hear them from another one.
I cannot understand, Mr. May, what you are allowing me to ask this question about. You're not uh, letting me ask him anything. Let me explain. The uh, general has given evidence about a series of meetings that you had with him. You yourself had with him in 1995, including uh, 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 comments which you have made. He has given evidence about uh, further meetings uh, in, uh, uh, at a time leading up uh, to the events in the Kosovo indictment. He has given evidence about meetings after Ratchak. Uh, now, those are all things, and they are meetings at which you were present, upon which uh, the witness has given evidence, and you can cross-examine. The other matters uh, are dealt with insofar as they are dealt with by other uh, witnesses, and you can uh, uh, ask them about it. But as far as this witness is concerned, I thought it was plain, you can ask him about his evidence, you can ask him about uh, uh, the statement he's made here, and your cross-examination will be so confined. So you could begin, for instance, by asking about the meeting in uh, August 1995 with Mr. Holbrook and various other people. Ask about that if you wish, if you challenge. If you don't challenge the witness's evidence here, why then, uh, there's no need to cross-examine it. Mr. May, of course I challenge uh, the testimony of General Clark because he has distorted the facts to a maximum degree, and I will show that. But it is absolutely not clear to me. You'd better get on with it. Put the questions you make these, um, these allegations witness should have the chance to answer them. General Clark, the... Uh, wait a moment. You've just made an allegation of assault which, which uh, a witness should have the opportunity of dealing with. General Clark, the, the accused uh, alleges to us that um, he challenges your um, evidence. Of course, he's entitled to do that. But he, what he does say is that you've distorted the facts about which you've given evidence. He makes an allegation. Perhaps you'd like to answer the allegation. Well, Your Honor, I gave the testimony to the best of my recollection. The facts are exactly as I re recollect them, and those are the facts I gave the court. Yes, Mr. Blossom. Mr. May. Just in order to clarify the basic attitude towards me in relation to this witness, is it in dispute that General Clark was in command of NATO during the war against Yugoslavia? And is it disputed that that was his most important role in everything uh, that related to Yugoslavia? And is it in dispute that you're not allowing me to ask him anything at all about that? That's right. Now, ask questions. If you wish to ask questions, concentrate on those matters that you've been told about several times. Now, what we're doing is wasting time going over this. You've heard the ruling, and you must, uh, you must abide by it. And you're taking up, or maybe you're taking up your time, you see, arguing. So, I cannot ask him anything at all about the war waged by NATO against Yugoslavia. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, Mr. May, that really is an example showing that this is truly nothing more than a farce.
you've got no questions for the witness, you needn't answer them. But if you want to, you must get on with it now. I also restrict your comments too. Very well, very well, Mr. May. I will move on to questions that you will allow, though I think this is scandalous that you're not allowing me to ask General Clark. I said you must uh, restrict your comments and not waste time. General Clark. General Clark, you started your testimony with your biography. Isn't that right? That's correct. In your biography or CV, I see that you were involved in, I don't know how to put it, in some uh, indirect relationships with your former President Clinton. Your Honor, I don't understand what the question is. If you don't, uh, General, if you don't understand a question, you don't have to answer it. Very well, General. Were you, for many years, a very close friend of your former President Clinton? Hi. What, what is the point of all this? Now, you've been told to answer the questions. I mean, to ask relevant questions, which the witness can answer. And that's not uh, such a question. You've, you have yet, may I point out, you have yet to challenge once a specific point uh, in, the, in the witness's evidence. Mr. May, it is relevant because in the CV it is stated that he only knew his former president superficially, whereas he personally told me in Holbrook's presence that they were very close friends from Arkansas, that they went hunting together, that they consult one another about everything. So it's quite different from what is represented in his CV. And I want to establish that the witness is not telling the truth, starting from his CV. Yes, the, the witness, you can ask the witness about that. It's a conversation you allege you had with him. Perhaps, General, you could just deal with that in your Honor, I did not tell President Milosevic that I was a close friend of President Clinton. I've never been hunting with President Clinton, and I did not and do not consult with President Clinton about everything. My relationship with President Clinton was formal. It was correct. He was the President of the United States. I was an officer in the United States Army. I worked during the time I was involved in the Dayton negotiations for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and as the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. I had a dual reporting chain. I reported through the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to the Secretary of Defense, and I reported to the NATO Military Committee and to the NATO Secretary General. So you are denying that in that building that you call a hunting lodge, when Holbrook, you and I were walking around, that both you and Holbrook were 
speaking about your direct and close relationships with President Kil Clinton. So you're saying that you didn't say that and that we didn't talk about that. Your Honor, I have no recollection of any such conversation, and I've never told anybody that I had a direct and close relationship with President Clinton. You even spoke about hunting wild geese. Do you remember that? Your Honor, I recall in the early days of the shuttle negotiations that on one occasion, President Milosevic, Ambassador Holbrook, and I went for a walk around a lake. During that period of time, I talked about duck hunting in the state of Arkansas. It had no relation to anything to do with President Clinton. It was no more than a social conversation intended to further the course of negotiations to seek an end to the fighting in Bosnia. And Mr. Milosevic, I point out that in the CV which we have in front of us in the exhibits, I may be wrong about this and I'll be corrected if I am, but in it I think I can see no mention of uh, President Clinton. It certainly mentions Little Rock, but uh, I can't see any other uh, mention at all, contrary to what you assert. Because it is contrary to what I am saying, what I'm trying to say is that at the time he was saying different things from what is now in the CV. Of course, he is now denying that, but we can move on. General Clark, you said that we met for the first time in August 1995. And uh, at the time, your delegation was complete. Do you remember that? Cruiser and Fraser and Drew and the others, they were all there. Isn't that right? Your Honor, in August of 1995, with the U.S. delegation, we met with Milosevic for the first time, as I recounted in my testimony. Is it true that this was the beginning of efforts to, re to initiate comprehensive negotiations on peace in Bosnia? Your Honor, this was the my first involvement in peace talks aimed at bringing an end to the fighting in Bosnia. However, there had been many efforts, as I'm sure the court is well aware, for many years to end the fighting in Bosnia. But that was the first direct involvement of an official American delegation headed by Holbrook. Isn't that right? Your Honor, to the best of my knowledge, that was the first engagement of Ambassador Holbrook. It was my first engagement. It's the first time the delegation was involved. Previously, uh, Ambassador Redmond had been involved with something called the Contact Group Peace Plan, as I recall. Apart from Redman, who was involved through the contact group, Bob Frazier came to see me, too, and he was 
a member of your delegation when you came, wasn't he? Your Honor, I have no direct knowledge of the specifics of Ambassador Frazier's visit with Milosevic, but I do recall hearing that Ambassador Frazier had previously met with Milosevic. Very well. Since you have no direct knowledge about it, though I doubt it, as you were all very well informed, do at least recollect that at that meeting, uh, that the meeting was imbued with a spirit of identical intentions, uh, that is, between those of Serbia and your delegation, and that was to achieve peace. At least that was what you were saying. Isn't that right, General? Your Honor, at the time of the meetings in August of 1995, we were sounding out each of the uh, factions and um, the participants in the fighting in Bosnia in an effort to find a way to end the fighting there. It was at that time unclear what President Milosevic's role might be, and that was the purpose of the meeting. You came to see me precisely for me to assist in achieving peace in Bosnia as soon as possible with the help of the authority enjoyed by the Republic of Serbia and me personally. Isn't that right, General? Your Honor, we came to see uh, Mr. Uh, the accused because we wanted to determine what his position would be on the strategic plan that we developed for trying to end the conflict and whether he could, in fact, provide a constructive role. Uh, we thought that he was going to be a factor, per, perhaps the dominant factor, in whether or not we could achieve peace, and we didn't know whether he would provide a constructive role or some other role. General Clark, do you remember that for several months prior to your inclusion, there was a contact group plan on the table which Serbia, the government of Serbia, and I personally had supported and insisted on this contact group plan being adopted, and that plan implied a separation of the entities in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the proportion 51-49 percent. Do you remember that? Your Honor, over the previous period of time, a contact group plan did emerge which called for a 51-49 division of the country. To the best of my knowledge, the uh, Serbs had never agreed to this plan. It was unclear to me personally what Milosevic's role might have been in proposing it, supporting it, or encouraging others to support it. What we knew was that the plan had not succeeded. We also knew that, that uh, Yugoslavia still had a major, if not dominating, role in continuing the conflict against the uh, Bosnian Muslim forces and uh, Croat forces, that there were uh, heavy weapons used, that the logistics seemed changed, seemed to go back to Yugoslavia, and, uh, and so it was unclear to me what Milosevic's role might have been during this period. Very well, General Clark. It's quite clear to me what your you wish to explain here, but let us go back to the meeting. That was the first meeting that you had in the territory of the former Yugoslavia, wasn't it? As a delegation. 
Your Honor, Your Honor this was our first meeting in uh, former Yugoslavia with uh, the then uh, head of Serbia. At that meeting, you presented a plan to me. You said that you were leaving already on the following day and that you would be talking to the leadership in Sarajevo, headed by Izetbegovic. Is that right? Your Honor, that is uh, correct. Do you remember that I suggested to you and that I cautioned you not to go as you had intended to go via Mount Igman because there isn't a proper road there. There is only a footpath there, basically. It's very dangerous. My suggestion to you was that you should take the normal road. Do you remember that? Your Honor, I don't remember all the ins and outs of this dialogue. What I do remember is that we had asked the accused to assure that we could get through on the normal road, that we wouldn't be stopped by checkpoints and other things. And I do recall that the accused was able to contact um, immediately, I believe it was uh, General Mladic, at least that was the impression that we were given, that I took from the meeting, and that he came back and said that he could not assure that we would have uh, an unrestricted passage in at that time th on the normal routes. General Clark. General Clark. It's exactly the other way around. I'm going to remind you. First of all, I'm not the one who went out in order to get into contact with anyone. It's my chef de cabinet, Goran Milinovic, who walked out. I never left the room. I went on talking to you. Do you remember that? Your Honor, I don't remember the specific details of who left the room or didn't at that point. Dobro, General Clark. All right, General Clark. How come you don't remember that Goran Milinovic brought a fax containing written guarantees from General Mladic that you would not be stopped anywhere and that you can pass along the normal route? That is what we discussed for a long time because he came back a few times in order to establish the exact wording of this guarantee so that it would be absolutely certain that nobody would stop you because Holbrook explained that it would be a great shame for the delegation if anyone stopped them anywhere. I assume you should remember that. It was the first meeting. Is that right or is that not right? Your Honor, I don't have any recollection of this specifically. I do remember that there was discussion about the route and that we were unable to get satisfactory guarantees that we could go through it, and that that's subsequently why we decided we would go the Mount Igmon route. I don't have any recollection of the details other than that there was some conversation with Milotic. That is to say that there was a report that someone had had a conversation with Milotic. We didn't see that we stayed in the room. Who might have had that conversation and what was carried back and forth and so forth, I don't recall. Don't you remember that you were given this guarantee into your very own hands in writing that you would not be stopped anywhere and that Holbrook refused this out of his very own vanity and that's why four of your men got killed on Mount Igman in the accident because uh, the APC tumbled. You cannot r remember that, General Clark? Four of your fellow members of the delegation got killed then. Is it your vanity? Your Honor, I can assure you I was never given any guarantee in my very own hands that we could travel in on the normal routes. I've never seen such, I've never seen such a document. I have no recollection of it whatsoever. Of course, I remember the tragedy on Mount Higmon. 
I think it's regrettable that it wasn't possible to go in on the normal routes. And at the time, I viewed that as a political decision by someone in an effort to delay our ability to consult with the Bosnian Muslim Authority, President Izabegovic, and Prime Minister Salajdic. General Clark. General Clark. This is really something that an honorable man should not allow himself to say. You know full well the effort that we made. This is all by way of comment. You've heard what the witnesses said. You challenge it. It doesn't seem to me we're going to get very much further, and not by sort of abuse of that kind. And do you remember at least, General Clark, that I was the one who categorically suggested to you not to go via Mount Igman by any means, to take the road around? And that is why we made every effort in order to obtain this guarantee for you. Do you remember that we categoric that I categorically advocated that, that you take the normal route, not the path across Mount Igman, and th that is why every effort was made for you to obtain this guarantee. You are speaking under oath here, and we have witnesses about this. Your Honor, we're talking about what I remember and what I don't remember in some kind of a meeting. In this meeting, I don't remember any of this emotion. I don't remember the sort of extreme efforts that the accused is presenting here. I remember. A, an ongoing discussion about whether or not there were assurances that we could in fact get through the checkpoints without being stopped. I recall the conclusion was that we could not. I'm not sure who the conversations were alleged to have taken place with, um, but I don't have these specific recollections. What I remember is the conclusion of the meeting, and at the conclusion of the meeting we determined that if we were going to consult in Sarajevo, we would have to do so not going through the checkpoints. You decided not to go there out of vanity, not because you did not get a guarantee. Isn't that right, General Clark? That's why your friends got killed. Your Honor, this is incorrect. All right, General Clark. Let us move on to other questions now. You said that you were surprised that I was advocating that Serbia play the main role in the negotiations. Isn't that right? Is that what you said a few minutes ago? Your Honor, Your Honor my statement was when the accused said that we should deal with him rather than the Bosnian Serbs, the question then that struck me was, how is it that it, he could be so certain, and what legal mechanisms did he have to be so certain that if a referendum were held on the peace agreement inside Yugoslavia that it would apply to the Bosnian Serbs, the leaders of a faction in another country? I was not certain and unclear as to what his authority was over these people. It wasn't clear to me that he had that authority, certainly not legally. And that was the basis for our questions. His answer was, of course, that they would not resist the will of the Serb people. And then I took advantage of the opportunity to ask him personally if it wasn't a matter of legality, then it was a matter of influence, and therefore 
what was the basis that we should assume he would have had influence over these people if he couldn't have prevented the uh, killing of innocents at Srebrenica? General Clark, you got everything mixed up now, but let us work our way through this detail by detail and then we're going to clarify it. Do you remember that precisely because Serbia and I personally advocated the achievement of peace? And we conducted marathon negotiations with the leadership of Republika Srpska. That included the entire leadership of Yugoslavia, Serbia, Montenegro, and Republika Srpska. And the patriarch of the Serbian Orthodox Church was present there, His Holiness Pavle. We reached agreement to establish a single delegation for the peace negotiations because this was in the interest of the entire Serb people, both in the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and Republika Srpska and all other people who live in the territory of the former Yugoslavia. Do you remember at least that? Your Honor, over the several years of the conflict, we had seen the accused's role as ambiguous. On the one hand, seem, seeming to encourage conflict, and on the other hand, seeming to, at times, support peace. During the period when we began the negotiations, um, he seemed to be attempting to portray himself as someone in favor of, of negotiations. And in response to our challenge about his influence, the next time we saw him, he reached into his pocket and he pulled out what we came to know as the Patriarch's Letter, which was the idea that there would be a single delegation that would be comprised of six people and that he would have the controlling vote on this delegation. What went into the completion of this, whether or not there were negotiations and how extensive they were, we have no direct knowledge. I have no direct knowledge of that. But I do recall the Patriarch letter. General Clark. General Clark, first and foremost, this was no letter of the Patriarch. This was an agreement reached between the leadership of Yugoslavia, the leadership of Serbia, the leadership of Montenegro, the leadership of Republika Srpska, in the presence of the Patriarch. We all signed this letter, including the representatives of Republika Srpska and the representatives of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. And finally, it was signed by the Patriarch, too, because in this way he wanted to attach importance to it and to bless the agreement. After all, this agreement does exist here. So during the break, could you please get a copy of this out for General Clark to see, because he is even twisting that. Mr. Nice, could you try and find it for the accused? Now, what, what are you alleging that, that General Clark has twisted? He's twisted everything, Mr. May. He's twisted everything. He's twisted the fact that Serbia was the main factor that advocated peace all those years, that Serbia made every effort to have this peace achieved, and that in very, very intensive negotiations, this was precisely attained. That is, that Serbia be actively involved in the peace process, and that the result of that was this agreement which includes the Patriarch's signature. Had this not happened... The General should be able to deal, and can only deal, with what he himself knew of the Serb negotiating side. General Clark, can you assist us um, 
as to what you knew of, of the position on the other side, in, in, we're now talking about um, August 1995, as to uh, the composition of the other side or anything of that sort. Yes, Your Honor, I do recall this letter. We called it the Patriarch Letter. Of course, it was an agreement, and it's the agreement that that uh, that the accused used to um, demonstrate that he was the person who should be consulted and was the lead for the negotiations. We called it the Patriarch Letter for short because it was signed by the Patriarch, among others. That's all. General Clark. General Clark. Then why did Serbia and why did I personally advocate having a single delegation? Wasn't it in order to have a guarantee that the peace agreement would be reached? Isn't that right, General Clark? Uh, Your Honor, I believe that uh, the single delegation was the response to the challenge that Ambassador Holbrook presented uh, in the first session that we had where we asked him, who should we consult with? Should we consult with the uh, Bosnian Serbs or you? Uh, President Milosevic at the time said, you should consult with me, of course. And th this is the uh, piece that I have testified about in my uh, opening testimony. This letter merely established the fact that he would have the ability to control the Bosnian Serb delegation, should there be disagreements. General Clark. General Clark, even what you said just now is not true, because I had advised you to talk to the leadership of Republika Srpska. Achieving a single delegation was, for us, a question of life itself, of peace, of attaining guarantees that peace would be achieved. If you want to remember this, and if you want something to jog your memory, which is obviously not your intention, I suggested to you precisely that you should talk to the leadership of Republika Srpska and that Serbia and the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia would give their maximum support to all peace efforts. At that time, we trusted you. At that time, we really believed that you were interested in peace. Wasn't that the way it was, General? Your Honor, what I remember of the first meeting was I don't remember President Milosevic telling us we should not talk to the Bosnian Serbs. What I do remember his saying was that he was the appropriate person to lead the peace discussions. I think his suggestion was that he advise you, General, to speak to the leadership of the uh, Republika Srpska. Did he do anything like that? Your Honor, whether the accused advises to speak to them or not, I don't recall. At the time, uh, they were both indicted war criminals, and so it wasn't our desire to speak to either Karadic or Mladic. Now, millimeter by millimeter, slowly but surely, General Clark, you are approaching the terrain of the truth. You did not want to accept my suggestions to talk to the leadership of Republika Srpska, and you explained this by saying that you did not want to talk to individuals who were indicted for war crimes. Is that right or is that not right, General Clark? That is just what you've said. What I just told you is my view. What I remember of the conversation at the time, Your Honor, was we asked the accused, should we be dealing with you or should we be dealing with the Bosnian Serbs? He said, you'll deal with me, of course. And he said, give me the terms of the peace agreement and we'll hold a referendum on them. I don't remember what other sideline of the conversation there might have been. 
I don't recall whether he would have ever said, by all means, talk to the Bosnian Serbs. The main thrust of the conversation was to establish him in a position of power and control over the process. That's what I took from the meeting. It's what I've testified about. Well, didn't you say just a few minutes ago that you did not want to talk to the leadership of Republika Srpska? because you said that you did not want to talk to individuals who had been indicted for war crimes. Isn't that what you said just a few minutes ago, General Clark? Your Honor, I did say that a few minutes ago, and that is, in fact, true, that we preferred not to have to do this negotiation with these individuals. Uh, Carl Bildt had already talked to these individuals, and uh, on the other hand, we were prepared to talk to them if that turned out to be absolutely necessary. It was simply one factor. And it was an irrelevant factor for the purposes of my testimony. As I'm explaining to you and as I've testified, it was President, then President Milosevic who explained that he was the person who should be dealt with in dealing with, uh, in, in talking about the uh, proposed peace agreement. General Clark, General Clark, this is a complete lie. We've been over this topic now for about 10 minutes. Let's move on to something else. General Clark, General Clark, didn't you say several minutes ago during the examination of in chief, or rather what is called the examination in chief here, didn't you say that I had persuaded you to talk to Karadzic and Mladic about the ways in which the bombing could be stopped, that you and Holbrook and the other members of the delegation withdrew in order to discuss this, namely whether you should talk to them at all? And I had called them so that they could talk to you and that ultimately you met up with them and talked to them. Is that true or is that not true, General Clark? Your Honor, this is correct that we did talk to Karadzic and Mladic on a subsequent meeting at the so-called hunting lodge during the time that the bombing was ongoing. Well, the point of my mediation was precisely for you to talk to the political and military leadership of Republika Srpska and reach agreement on the terms under which the bombing could be stopped. I wanted to help the bombing stop. Wasn't that the main reason? Wasn't that the main objective? Isn't that right, General Clark? Your Honor, I believe that that is correct that President Milosevic um, called these people together. He wanted them to talk to us. As he told us at the time, he said, this bombing is hurting the cause of peace. He wanted the negotiations to uh, proceed, at least that was my understanding. And we did subsequently talk to those people. Well, all right. At that meeting with Karadzic and Mladic, didn't you reach agreement on the terms for having the bombing stopped? Isn't that right or is that not right? Your Honor, it's correct that at this meeting we agreed on a ceasefire to um, around Sarajevo and that when that was uh, accepted and implemented that we would be able to halt the NATO bombing in the fall of 1995. So my mediation between you and the political and military leadership of Republika Srpska helped lead to a halt in the bombing and creating conditions for peace negotiations. Isn't that right, General Clark? This is correct. And is it correct, General Clark, that this was not your first meeting with Mladic, 
that you had met Mladic on an individual basis and independently of that before. That's correct. When did you meet Mladic? On my first trip to Bosnia in 1994, I met with leaders on both sides at the instructions of some of the suggestions of some of my colleagues in Washington. I met with Izabegovic, Salaitic, Delic, and Mladic. All right. Did you meet anyone else from the Serb side then, or did you only meet with Mladic? I don't recall who else might have been in that meeting with Mladic. And did you achieve anything at that meeting with Mladic? Your Honor, what I remember about the meeting with Mladic is that we discussed the contact group peace plan, that Mladic was uh, angry, belligerent, um, refused to agree to the peace plan, and uh, was uh, attempting to uh, threaten the uh, Bosnian Muslims should the United States provide assistance to them. I took extensive notes on the meeting, and it was a helpful meeting for me to understand um, what it was like to uh, deal with uh, Bosnian Serbs. As far as I can remember, that meeting of yours was very cordial. It wasn't any kind of quarrel. Isn't that right, General Clark? Your meeting with General Mladic, according to what you told me and according to what Mladic told me, was very cordial. Mladic praised you a great deal, that you had a lot of understanding, and then also you said to me all the best about Mladic. Isn't that right, General Clark? No, I don't. Uh, Your Honor, I don't remember making any complimentary remarks about General Mladic. But at the meeting that I had with Mladic, um, I listened to his views. I did write his views down. I said I would convey those views to Washington. They were angry. They were belligerent. Um, they were, um, they were not the views of someone who could agree to stop fighting. And in fact, uh, he did not agree at that time in the summer of 1994 that he would advocate Serbs signing the uh, contact group peace plan at the time. Um, I did my best to bring Mladic around to a position that was more constructive, but I was ultimately unsuccessful in doing so. Do you remember, General Clark, that Mladic's position then was to stop all hostilities throughout Bosnia-Herzegovina? Well, you told me about that. You told me about your experience with Mladic when we first met with this entire delegation. I don't remember going into any detail on my experience in the meeting with Mladic, um, Your Honor. I just simply have no recollection of that. I remember in the first meeting that Ambassador Holbrook uh, did most of the talking, and uh, I think I was introduced, and the only substantive conversation I had with President Milosevic that I can remember was the one that I have produced here in evidence. I think uh, that, that the accused is referring to the general Bosnian Serb position that what they wanted to do was freeze the positions as they were in 1994, in which um, the Serb side controlled much more than 49 percent of Bosnia-Herzegovina. That was the position at the time. And um, that was going to be an unacceptable position in terms of a peace settlement. And uh, that was the Bosnian-Serb position. Simply stop fighting, we'll hold on to what we have. As I recall, it was 60 or 70 percent of the territory. First of all, you are now interpreting people's intentions, General, and you are saying that people had ill intentions. and. 
As for that meeting with Mladic in 1994, it was aimed at suggesting the cessation of all hostilities throughout Bosnia-Herzegovina in order to promote the peace process. Isn't that? I'm going to stop the uh, cross-examination continuing on these lines. The witness has told you what he can remember of it. We need to move on to something else. I really don't understand, Mr. May, what you're actually allowing me to ask this witness. Rep not repetition is one thing. We've been over that conversation several times. Was that conversation between you a cordial one or not? I mean between you and Mladic. Your Honor, I did my best to have a cordial conversation with General Mladic. I have to say that it was difficult to do so. What do you mean it was difficult? There are photographs a couple of weeks ago. Months ago, the Belgrade Weekly Nin carried on its front page a photograph with Mladic smiling, Mladic wearing your cap and he and you wearing his. It was a cordial encounter. You could have seen this photograph on the front page of the Belgrade Weekly Nin, an issue two months ago, I think. I can't give you the exact date, but it's easy to find. Isn't that the best proof that you had uh, a good understanding between you, a cordial meeting, in accordance with what I'm saying? Do you remember that? Your Honor, the best proof of the quality of the meeting is my memory, which I've already described to this court on two, okay, two separate answers to this question. This was a difficult meeting. I did my best in terms of military diplomacy to take something constructive from it. Very well, General Clark. Since you said that the Serbs held a large percentage of the area, which is quite true, are you aware, first of all, that their public statements were that they would reduce that percentage of the area and that that is something that they wish to negotiate with the other two sides? Do you remember that? That was the contents of all the talks conducted in Geneva by Owen and Stoltenberg, who also are fully aware of those statements of theirs. Your Honor, I'm not the expert on the Owens and Stoltenberg talks. <clears throat> At the time, I was not engaged in this issue, and I can't provide any direct testimony about it. Perhaps you can help us with this. As far as you were concerned, General, was that the uh, Serb position? I have no recollection of the details of the Serb position. What I recall was that at the time that I came into the uh, process of trying to bring peace to the Balkans, there was a contact group plan. The contact group plan was rejected by the Serb assembly in Pale. And in its place was a proposal that simply all fighting stop, and that's what I remember, that they would simply freeze in place. Whether there was anything that went beyond that or not is not clear to me. I just don't have any recollection of it. Yes, well, that's a, a convenient time. We're going to adjourn now. Uh, we'll adjourn for 20 minutes. All rise, we will live in.